Today on the Basketball Manitoba podcast, we have Dean Favoni. Dean is the varsity boys coach at Dakota Collegiate, a role he's held for over 30 years. He's coached many top 10 players in the province, and in 2002, his team won the provincial championship. He has been MBCA Coach of the Year and has coached with the provincial team and the Center for Performance. His most recent success has been the fundraising and creation of a state-of-the-art $1.5 million multi-sport complex, which includes an outdoor basketball court in honor of the great Dale Bradshaw. Dean, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Darcy. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I was told uh, by a few people that you're one of our few fans, <laughs> that, that you're fairly consistent. So for you to be on here, this is a, this is a, you know, this is a big moment for you. This is, this is what I've been told. Now, I, you know, I treat everybody the same. But, uh, you know, I honestly, super, super excited to have you on the podcast. Thanks. I enjoy listening to them. It's uh, most of the people you've interviewed are people I've coached against as coaches or players or people that right. I've heard of. And uh, I, I enjoy the, the stories that come along with it. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And that's the that's the best part of it for me as well is just the stories. Um, and so I know you have some. So we're definitely going to dig okay. in there. But I actually wanted to start with... Um, how I guess I know you or how I've met you. Um, And interestingly enough, like, you know, you were coaching back when I was a player, like you been around for player. Correct. Correct. And um, so I got to (laughs) ask back when I was playing, how old were you? Because when I was in my mind, you know, high school kids have zero, zero perception. Like we have no idea how old people are. We don't, we don't know. Sometimes we're being coached by absolute legends. I I, I remember being, uh, uh, talking to Ross Wedlake and he was refing a game where I was a high school coach. This is an absolute legend. I'm like, who is this ref? Like what's going on here? He's making terrible Uh calls. This guy's a legend. So the question I have for you is how old are you when I was, uh, uh, playing and and you were coaching and how long had you been coaching for? What year did you graduate? So, uh, I graduated the year before you won it in 2000. So at that 2001, point, sorry, I, 2001, sorry. My, my you graduated mistake. 2001. Yeah. Yeah. So I had been coaching. Yeah. I was probably in my early thirties then. Okay. Okay. So we said th- over 30 years that you've been coaching at Dakota. Yeah. So I went from high school at Transcona collegiate. My high school coach was Jerry Badu who loved basketball and we played all the time at, he was ready to play any noon hour after school. It was great. And went from there to U- University of Winnipeg for four years. And then I got the job here at Dakota. So I was here when I was 22 years old. That's I why. Was coaching, I was coaching JV boys for two years with uh, Manoj Narang. And yeah. then did the varsity team every year after that. But yeah, okay. I started here when I was 22 and was the varsity coach at 24. Okay. So that, that makes sense as to why I'm like, you know, this is, it's, it's, uh, and and it's interesting because so I wasn't too far off. I mean, at that time you had been coaching for quite a while. Like I mean, not thirty years, but it's not like you Correct. were in your second year or anything like that at no, that time. No, not brand new. Yeah, that's uh, that's super interesting because I remember I was talking to um, a good friend of mine, Graham Bodner, uh, who I know is listening right now, <laughs> and who's, my, who's and, now my new neighbor. He lives across yeah, the yes, this is true. I know. He told yes. me I went to his house. He said, you know who lives down the street? And he's like, I was like Dean. I'm like, oh, cool. that's, and, that's crazy. There is there uh, is no one that likes basketball more than more than Bob. Oh, it's it's unbelievable. It's it's uh, it's he's uh, he, he loves the game. Absolutely. So he, what he told me was um, he said he told me to ask you that. He's like, ask Dean how old he was, because when we were playing, I felt like he was he'd been coaching forever. So like how when did he get started right and so i was like that 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 question comes from him but you mentioned early on um you know you went to transcona so you're a transcona kid you you're correct up there born and raised yep born and raised and now and, and now you've lived most of your life now on the south side correct i live close to school yeah <laughs> yeah close yeah. to school so then who, what, who what were you out or got out depending on your perspective. <laughs> oh easy now there's some there, we we may have some people that are from transcona I have, I have nothing but fond memories of transcona okay uh, well, Yes. So then what was what was the um, situation um, in Transcona? You'd mentioned your coach uh, there. Like, when did you get started playing basketball and like getting involved in the game as a kid? So when I was a kid growing up, there was no club, right? Everything happened through through school. And uh, I remember my dad uh, putting a hoop up on the on the garage and shooting hoops with my with my dad and my brother. And then uh, through junior high and high school, I had two really good friends, Mike and Kevin. And Kevin lived 
half a block from our from Transcona Collegiate, and we would go there and play on his hoop, which is a little lower and easier to uh, <laughs> easier to dunk and do some things on. Probably too low to actually get better on, but we we enjoyed that. And uh, the three of us, along with my brother Perry, we played there all summer, any chance we could get. And Seven Eleven wasn't far away. And as a kid, we could play and then go grab a drink and come back and and play some more. But the uh, the funny thing about that is my friend Mike uh, and we remain friends to this day. Yeah. So the three of us were on the high school team together. And but Mike at some point in junior high or high school had a had a medical something was wrong with his leg and his hip, and he had to have surgery. Mm-hmm. And it all, all healed fine, but he had this medical note that exempted him from all phys ed classes, but somehow he still managed to play on the, on the JV and varsity basketball team. So here he is practicing and playing and we're going to games and tournaments together, but he's got this note that exempts him from anything to do with in school phys ed. <laughs> so wait, hold on. Did he get out of phys ed for his entire high school? Like... Correct. Correct. I don't think he attended one phys ed class and graduated and has, has, has his, has his high school diploma without doing any phys ed, but he was on the basketball team. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So then, so you, you played, were you guys any good in high school? Like was Transcona any good back then? No, <laughs> I, I would, I would say not like I, my grade 11 year, I'd say we were better than grade 12, but I don't have a recollection of, of going to provincials. Like I never went to provincials as a kid in high school. Mm-hmm. And then when I started coaching here and there's a little bit different um, environment and culture around sport at Dakota. And if I were to compare the teams that I've coached here against the teams that I played on, I think the teams here are, are much, much more talented. And that, that doesn't take away from my experience here. Like I, I loved it. I loved my coach, Jerry Badu, and I loved my teammates. I, I just think we were, we were average. Mm-hmm. Like, but, mm-hmm. but I will say that my first year at Dakota, our varsity boys were in the final four. And part of the Transcona was in the final four that year. Oh. Um, and I th- they made the championship game and lost, I think, to Daniel Mack. But I remember being so happy for Jerry to, to have reached that point in his coaching career because he'd put in so much time with, with so many of us and I was really yeah. happy for him. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So, you, you know, you went on, obviously, like you, 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 you kind of mentioned how quickly you ended up coaching. So, yeah. you know, typically when that takes place, like there's not a lot of, of playing. If you're starting at 22, you graduate, you get right to Dakota. Um, Correct. So kind of walk us through this this path, because at what point, I mean, let me ask you this question. At what point did you, was, was your first, first coaching experience? Like, was it at Dakota that was number one? Or did you do no, any other coaching camps of any no, kind? I did. I went back to my high school and I coached, actually played a lot of soccer growing up. So I had a, I helped coach a soccer team at Transcona Collegiate. And then when I was student teaching, I helped coach, I think it was a grade eight or grade nine girls team. I did some of the, you, you would remember the regional teams that existed yeah, back yeah. then. Yeah, so of course. I, I, I helped out with the regional team. Um, but when I had, the job was posted here and I got my job. I remember I'd say half of the interview um, with Wayne Ruff was on coaching and what I wanted to coach and mm. some coaching philosophy questions, which I did my, did my best to answer. But at, at 22, I had certainly limited experience with leading any group of people to do anything. Yeah. Like, yeah. I have my degree and had lots of involvement with some church youth group stuff, but I was not a seasoned coach with lots of experience by a long shot. But uh, I, I know I'm convinced that being willing to coach and get involved in the school was a big part of why I got hired. Mm-hmm. So then, so what brought you to coaching? You said you helping out at, at, at Transcona, like what actually even got you to doing that stuff? My dad had coached us as me and my brother and, and my sister along the way growing up. My dad was a big community guy mm-hmm. and I, I knew I just, that was coaching at school as part of my giving back to the school and my way of contributing beyond the classroom. I think schools work better if there's a bunch of people in them that are willing to do things beyond the, you know, your day-to-day classroom curriculum stuff that that's, that's not the main part that kids are going to remember. That's for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then, so you're doing that while you were in uh, university, you're kind of coaching at TTI. And so then you graduate, how quickly did you get to Dakota? How did did you get that offer like straight away? Uh, That's a great story. So I had applied for a job and at that time there was no, in the, 
90s, early 90s, like 90, 90, 91, I put my resume out there. I mailed my resume to multiple divisions, <laughs> got some uh, got some calls, had an interview, didn't get it. And then this job came open and I it was for, I think it was, it was a math job. And mm -hmm. I applied, got the interview. And at the end of the interview, they told me, and this is in June, they said, well, we're not going to hire this position now. We, we're going to rejig some of the postings. Uh, we want you to keep your eye open. We'll repost this. We want you to reapply over the summer. Okay. So I sat on this for the summer, and uh, nothing came up, came from it. And uh, late August, it was reposted, and I applied again and had an interview set up for Labor Day long weekend. And coincidence, that weekend, I was helping run a church youth retreat in Brandon. Okay. And so I uh, had a, an interview ready to go, and uh, I think for the Saturday or the Sunday of the long weekend, but as I'm leaving on Friday for Brandon for this event, my phone rings and uh, my home phone rings. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. And <laughs> phone rings and uh, it's, it's Bob Town. Yeah. It's Bob Town, who's at the time as principal of Nelson Mack, who's the guy you should interview on the podcast. He's, uh, he is uh, coming up right away. <laughs> so but I don't know who Bob is. I have no <laughs> basketball knowledge at this point about who bob town is i don't know these principal. he says hey i'm principal of nelson mac we found your resume we want to interview you i said oh i said i'm leaving for brandon right now he said well stop in on your way out we won't take long i said i have my sister and her friend with her and he says well they can wait in the office <laughs> I, I said i said i'm i'm in shorts and a t-shirt i'm not really dressed for an interview he said we're very casual just stop in yeah so i can't say no so i go to the interview on the friday and uh, have the inter interview ends. And I said, like, I'm, I'm driving to Brandon right now. Can I get a hold of you? And he said, give me a minute. So him and I assume the vice principal left the room and they come back in and, and he says, I'd like to offer you the job. And it was wow. for a three quarter time, three quarter time math job. And I said, well, that's great, but I've got, I've got an interview at Dakota on s Saturday or Sunday. And, and this is, I, I owe so much to Bob town for this. I'll never forget this. And he tells me, here's what I want you to do. Go have the interview at Dakota, and if they offer you the job, I want you to take it. Wow! I said, "Oh, why? Why is that? Like you're offering me three quarter there, only half time." And he says, "Well, we are a small at the time. There, the divisions were different than they are now." And he said, "We're a small. We're the only English speaking high school in our division, and we're tiny." He said, "Chances for you for long term employment are better with Dakota than with us." He said, "If they offer you the job, I want you to take it." And he oh, could have wow. easily, you see, it's late, it's Labor Day weekend. He needs a teacher for five days. So he easily could have said, you know what, I put the screws to me and just yep. forced me to make a decision. And he didn't. So I got in the car, drove to Brandon, uh, ran the retreat for a day or two, drove back to Winnipeg, had the interview, second interview with Dakota, told them I had an offer from Nelson Mack, uh, went to my now wife's apartment waited for a phone call from Dakota. They offered <laughs> me the job. I accepted. I called Bob back, thanked him and declined, drove back to Brandon, finished the retreat, <laughs> drove back to Winnipeg on Monday and started at Dakota on Tuesday. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, uh, wow. Years went by, a few years went by and, and Bob Town's oldest boy was playing for Glenlawn. Mm -hmm. And I saw him in the crowd and uh, I called him out and I said, I don't know if you remember me, but I need to thank you. And he said, Oh, I remember you. So Yeah, yeah. And I later went on to coach his second son, Andrew, who was a Dakota kid. Yeah, yeah. So like yeah, I obviously played with uh Sean. Sean's uh his starts getting right. Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh the South Side connections here in basketball and, and then the Bob Town thing. That's so funny because I mean he's literally, I think, coming up soon. Like we're interviewing him after this. So he's, that's he's, uh he's great. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. That but, the, but what a what a weird um connection just to kind of uh yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. So you start at Dakota, <laughs> like you said, you started off pretty straight away. But you were you didn't start coaching that same year, did you? Correct. You did. Yep. Oh, yep. Wow. I was doing okay. two years of the JV boys with uh, Manoj Narang. Okay, and then what oh, was like that? Like that's your first, I guess, high school boys correct. basketball experience. Like, do you, what do you remember yeah, from, from those first couple of years? Um, what do I remember from that? I don't know. I think we. Manoj and I are different personalities. I think we learned a few things from each other. Um, mm. But I, like, I was so green. Like, I was going to say, I, <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't know a whole lot. That, that's for sure. 
I, I was willing to try and get in there and learn. Um, and it's it stuck. Like I've been doing it every year since. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, on that note, like, tell me about some of you, some of your mentors. Like, it was in thirty years. You obviously, like you said, you yeah. started with Minaj. You're green. Sh- and shout out to Minaj. My actually, again, getting back to the your weird coach. circular. Your my coach. coach. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's, there's a weird connections here. But, yeah. uh, um, but uh, like, who are some of those mentors that you know you're green, and then all of a sudden you're like, hey, yeah. like I need help. Uh, t- tell us, tell so, me about that. I think I've learned basketball from a lot of people, Mm -hmm. but I would like to say I've learned most of what I've learned about coaching. I've learned from Phil Hudson. Mm. So I might be the first guy in your basketball podcast to reference a volleyball coach, but uh, Phil Hudson was here before I got here. And I think we taught together for 28, 29, maybe the, maybe 30 years. He's now the women's coach at uh, university of Winnipeg for the Mm -hmm. volleyball program. And he is terrific. Like, I couldn't get enough of listening to him. So I would go to the odd volleyball practice. I'd go to volleyball games. I'd ask if I could oh, sit on his bench. I would really ask, ask to be part of team meetings as they're heading into Final Fours. I'd go to the odd video session. Not because I was interested in, you know, the scheming of volleyball. Because I, I, I didn't play. And I have limited really limited knowledge of that, but I just wanted to hear how he said things, hear how he talked to people, mm. hear, see how he ran a practice. What was his focus mentally as he's getting guys ready for big games? I asked to sit on his bench sometimes, be part of the huddles, mm-hmm. um, and just tried to listen to as much as I could. And he taught a class here in, I think it was called Rec, Rec Athletics and Leadership. Mm-hmm. And it's a classroom-based course. And phys ed class in the classroom so they go to whatever room is open at the time and yeah. if if it happened to be in the room i was teaching in i'd ask them if i could stay and i'd stay in and listen to as much as i much as i could and as i was marking or prepping or doing whatever but i w- just uh for like i said for almost 30 years it was a well-worn path between my room and the gym as i would consult with him on all kinds of things about and we would talk about his practices and his games and my practices my games and yeah. his, it was a uh, you know, you see each other in the morning and one of the first co- comments or questions to each other was, how was your practice last night? Who's doing mm-hmm. well? What mm-hmm. went well? What are we working on? And it was back and forth like that for a long time. It was, it's, uh, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. That's but interesting. The basketball, I... Go ahead. The bas- sorry, there's the, the basketball I've learned from lots of people, but coaching, yeah. uh, I'm, I was really lucky to, to be in a school with a guy who's that accomplished and that good mm-hmm. at his craft. Mm-hmm. And, and so, Talk to me a little bit more about that because I have this this uh, realization at some point. I don't remember when it was, um, but I came to realize probably through experiences with really good leaders and coaches and people who weren't really good leaders and coaches that coaching is a skill in itself and knowing about basketball does not make you a good coach, right? Like you can know a whole bunch about basketball that does not make you a good coach. And the theory that I had is that you could bring in, again, Phil Hudson, you could bring in a hockey coach. If, if they have the right assistance um, and they know how to uh, motivate people and connect with people, they will do a better job than someone who really knows basketball but doesn't have those skills. Yeah, and he's and he's shown that. Like, he's he's coached all kinds of sports. I, partly because that's his job in phys ed, but I know he's yeah. coached hockey and ringette, and, and he's been – he's successful. Like, I'm just, again, so grateful to have been around him. But the basketball-wise, like, when I was here, there was a guy – who coach was coaching varsity girls at the time was Carl Lowen, who's since moved on to Texas. And he was, he was helpful when I first got going. Um, I would watch, I never really, I, Randy Cassano is a, is of course a legend here. And I, and I've learned mm-hmm. a lot from watching Randy's teams. I can't say I've actually sat down and like, Randy, tell me how to do this or what do I do yeah. here? But I would watch Oak Park a lot. Like they are successful mm. all the time. Yeah. What, like, what can I do to be, kind of elevate our program status to the stuff that Oak Park was doing. But mm-hmm. I remember sitting down with his longtime assistant or co-coach, Darren Klappick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I met Darren. Darren's brother, Terry, was a is a good friend of mine through university. And I remember asking Darren once if I could, like, I have questions. So I was sitting in his living room, ask, picking his brain about stuff. And, and he, he asked me at one point, he said, so, like, his Oak Park was always so good defensively. I said, so he asked me, he says, Dean, what's your defensive philosophy? And I've been doing this for two, two, three years only. And a defensive philosophy, 
We're just trying to not let them score. Like, what do you mean philosophy? I just don't want them to put the ball in the bucket. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. like, he started asking me questions and showing me things about, you know, the the strategizing and the philosophy behind what you're trying to accomplish. And you're not just doing a drill. Like, if things have purpose, and your team has to have a united, common vision of what they're trying to do defensively to accomplish to, mm -hmm. to stop them from putting the ball in the bucket yeah, right so yeah uh, but darren was great early on um and as i progressed i ended up coaching and i would say this is the mid 2000s uh, martin riley's kids and mm -hmm. martin would come watch games and i knew martin because he had coached at dakota my first year there he wasn't teacher here but he was the coach for one year and uh his resume is second to none like yeah playing and coaching and um martin i would ask martin for help the odd time and he kind of tried to shrug me off at the start. <laughs> like, you, do, you don't need my help you know what you're doing it's like martin i'm asking for some input here can you and uh, martin i consider martin to be a very good friend of mine now and he was nothing but generous and kind with his time and advice to me and i, mm. I sat at his dining room table way more than once <laughs> trying to yeah. get uh some help and some like what do we do here what do we do here and yeah which was out which was terrific like i owe a lot to martin for the for how i run things and um i know there's lots of coaches around the province right now that would say the same about him uh yeah but like if you want like i and i just go and watch a game with him and sit with him watching somebody else play there's nobody who's a quicker study and analyzer of what's going on about tendencies or what kids can and can't do and what teams can and can't do than sitting with Martin Riley. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm nothing but grateful for, for my time spent, spent with him around the table or sitting at a, sitting at a game or in his basement talking about basketball. Like it's, um, it's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, there's, 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 there's obviously a, a legend around him for a reason. And uh, every, oh. every, every person I know that's interacted with him in some way, whether it was when he played and they played against him or they went to a camp with him, uh, yeah. As the instructor, I have my own uh, memories mm -hmm. of him as being in high school and, and and playing when he just showed up one time and played. And uh, yeah, man, special, special, I, special guy for I sure. I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think him doing a podcast is on his radar. Um, <laughs> but if you can get him on, uh, his stories are are terrific. It would be our honor to have him on. And so yes. if you want to, you, you, you said he's a good friend. So maybe nudge him a little bit, say, Hey, you know what? Uh, you know, I was on the, po the, po yeah. the podcast, uh, your name came up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I would love to. I've, uh, you know, I, I'll share my super quick story. I was at a camp and man, just the way that he told stories, I was like, this guy's amazing. Like just him standing there telling a story. And then mm -hmm. he show, showed us like a few dribbling moves. And I was like, well, like I've never met this guy before. It didn't matter. This guy's, you know, there's certain people who have a certain presence about them, certain confidence, yep. certain ability, and it's detectable like instantly. Like you just know, you're like, oh, this person, I should be listening to this person for what, you know, and he's one of those people for sure, 100%. Yep. Um, okay, so speaking of philosophies and values, I mean, you you know, you, you mentioned getting some of those early lessons from a volleyball coach. So, you know, yep. understanding that like just coaching and leading people can come from anywhere. Um, Talk to me about some of your values and, and philosophies. Like they've probably changed over time with regards to like your basketball philosophies, like the, you know, on the court stuff. But, you know, talking like maybe like speaking first, like maybe your off court philosophies, because one thing that um, if your name comes up, obviously people know in, in the basketball community, they know Dakota and they say, man, Dean's such a nice guy. Everyone likes Dean, right? You're, you've been known as you're one of like the nice guys in the community, right? People enjoy being around you. Um, but I think you know, your personality is going to, um, it's going to elicit certain um, responses from people, right? And and how you uh, use that to your advantage to kind of navigate certain situations. And when you're coaching, that's essentially what you're doing. You know, you're trying to motivate people and you're trying to support them. And so starting there, you know, we talk about some of your, the things that you've learned and, and the philosophies and values that you have in coaching your teams that have been, um, maybe that have been with you from the start or have changed over time. Yeah. That's a good question. Stuff does change over time for sure. Mm -hmm. Partly as people age or I age and partly as the game changes yep. and as kids change and as my age, the kids don't change age, right? Like I'm coaching the same age of kid now yeah. as I did when I was 24. 
So uh, a six-year age gap between me and my players when I, you know, was getting going as opposed to now a, you know, 35, 40-year age gap between me and the kids. But at the end of the day, I would, like, I appreciate these things. People say I'm a nice guy. Um, that, <laughs> Except when you're talking to the refs during the game, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I would, I would... I would hate it if a kid were to leave my program and say that it was a waste of time or that mm. it was, I didn't get better as a basketball player or I didn't enjoy my experience uh, playing basketball at Dakota. That would, that would bother me. Um, I try to elicit, uh, I am certainly not a, you know, I'm my way or the highway guy. Like I, mm -hmm. I rely on my assistants. I rely on, on, on the players for feedback. I run stuff by them. We have, we have player meetings. I have pull two or three kids aside and, and run stuff by them. I'm thinking this might be a good direction for us. What do you think? Mm -hmm. um, so I try to involve lots of people. Um, but like, yeah, d the nice comment is, is appreciated, but I'm also at the same time competitive. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a bit of a fire when I'm coaching, when I'm in practice and in games sometimes. And I think, the people that only know me from classroom or only know me away from the gym and then see a little bit of that competitiveness, I think sometimes they're a little surprised, but mm -hmm. um, that's the name of the game is to try to be competitive and try to do what you can to be, to be successful. Yeah. And so you mentioned um, the, you know, people who see you in the classroom. So you're not a phys ed guy and like most most people, most coaches are like phys ed guys, right? They're in the gym all the time. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm in the gym. I'm, I'm a gym guy, right? You're a math teacher, correct? Correct. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, how, how does that differ from, let's like, say, the general experience, um, or at least what you've heard? Because I know you know lots of yeah. phys ed teachers. So, talk to me yeah. about that. So often mistaken for a phys ed guy because I spend yeah. lots of time in the gym, but no, my. My degree, I have a degree in math or a science degree in mathematics, and I've been a math teacher my whole career and love it. But sometimes people ask me what the difference is or which is easier, which is harder. And I, I to be honest, I don't think it's close. I think coaching is is by far more challenging of an experience and an, mm. and an endeavor than than teaching. So, and I tell this to my to my team, like if I have twenty five to thirty kids in a classroom and we're teaching pre-cal, essential math, apply, whatever we're doing. And I'm teaching everybody at once, just like I do my team. I'm teaching everybody some concept in math. But really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if person sitting in the middle of the room gets it or doesn't get it, and person in the front does get it, person in the back doesn't. Mm -hmm. I, you hand out the test, the kids do what they do, and they each get an individual mark. Yeah. And so apart from a kid being like, completely out of line and belligerent and one person in the room does not have necessarily a significant impact on somebody else's success or non-success where in basketball we either at the end of the game we all win the game or we all lose the game mm. and for us to win the game the, the the star of the team needs other kids to help them be successful everybody contributes the role guys you know the guys who who have a starting role, but they are a defensive stopper. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to work together to be successful. Where that's not the case in classroom. Like if mm -hmm. you're really bright and I teach you, you're going to do really well. Yeah. And if yeah. somebody else doesn't do very well at all, if they're terrible at it and they miss a bunch of classes, it doesn't affect you. No. But if you have a bunch of kids who are missing practice, and that you lose that kind of that unity and that uh, momentum you have built as a group. It, it affects everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I walk into a classroom, I'm told what to teach. I have a curriculum. I follow this. I do this True. next. I do this next. I do this next. In coaching, the kids show up, you run your tryout, and now you're going to lead your team. Okay, practice one. What are you doing? There's no curriculum. No one's telling you what to do. You have to figure out what they need help with, mm -hmm. what you need to teach, how you're going to spend your time. And how can you best get everyone working together to be successful? I, I think it's mm -hmm. a huge, so hmm. coaching is teaching, but I think coaching and getting everyone on board, working towards something that's a common goal 
towards something that's bigger than themselves is much more challenging than teaching is. And teaching's hard to begin with. I think, yeah. I think, I think coaching is, is, uh, is a tougher, tougher, tougher gig. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I never really thought like, you know, everything you say, I'm like, yeah, that, that, that's obvious. That's obvious. I've never actually given it any thought, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think what tends to happen, or at least my initial thought is, Hey, I love coaching probably more than, and I love that challenge of trying to motivate people. So, you know, something that might be harder, you don't necessarily factor in the, um, but, but you enjoy it more necessarily. Like, so for me personally, I would enjoy the coaching more than being in the classroom. So even though it would be harder, I never actually gave a thought. It's a different question, right? Like what's harder, not what do you enjoy more? You know what I mean? And so I never yeah, actually I enjoy, I enjoy came both. It. For sure. I for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's why I continue to do both for as long as I've done them at the same, yeah. the same school. Like I, I really love both. Like I, yeah. I, I love teaching math and I love seeing kids be successful there. And I love, I love coaching. So, the, so have you ever, have you ever used your math knowledge or math perspective to benefit or help you coaching basketball ever? Without question, for sure. Okay, tell tell so me how. Numbers, guy, it? analytics. So I'm yes. lucky that I have had the, one of my assistants, Drew Russenholt, has been with me since like 2010, 2011. And it's one thing to go to practice every day, but you get to go to practice with one of my best friends. And but Drew is Drew, Drew's a stats guy. Like I have mm -hmm. a consistent guy, and you would appreciate this as a guy who oh, yeah. runs stat trackers. Absolutely. So yeah. Drew, Drew keeps stats for our games, and it's not just point. Like I've got I got the whole slate. Like I've got everything. Really. And I can yes. And so I, I go over that, and I, I remember a few years ago looking at it, going, "Well, these I knew these two kids scored." The majority of points and like figure percentage wise what they score and they were scoring about 60 percent of our points which was fine i said and looked at it some more and went yeah they're only taking 40 percent of the shots so so when hmm. the team, like how come these two guys are scoring 60 percent of our points with 40 percent of the shots you guys are taking 60 percent of the shots and yeah, scoring 40 percent of our points <laughs> so what's what's wrong with this equation here yeah so we tried to focus and like so now it's not just me saying get these two guys yes. the ball yes. it's 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 backed up like you you're taking more shots and you're less successful yeah that's not good for us yeah so i'm not saying don't shoot i'm saying let's play to our strengths here and get the ball in the hands of the guys who are having more more success for us right now yeah yeah absolutely like, i'm yeah. lucky with that one yeah yeah, yeah. no kidding like, yeah consistency Success, I think, is also consistency of, like he's, people use the term program, but like Drew's been with me since 2010 or 11. That's a long mm -hmm. time for one high school assistant to be in the same spot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have Chit Goswami, who's mm -hmm. been with me for, I don't know, eight, 10 years, maybe, maybe more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Chit is as knowledgeable about basketball as anybody. Like, it's, it's, he's not, He's not your average assistant. Like he's coached mm -hmm. provincial teams. Like well, he's he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the like Wolves he, program he's for a long super time as well. And yeah. and the more people I can put, around, I'm smart enough to put smart people around. Me, <laughs> there you go. Right? Yeah. Like um, to be around people that are committed and successful and have have good things to say and good things to offer. Yeah, so, absolutely. And, and Chit, Chit for sure is in that boat. Yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent. Chit's been in the game for a long time, and like I said, you did the wolf stuff for a long time as well. Provincial teams, yes. like, and that's an that's assistant for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's. Yeah. Like... Who who has an assistant with that kind of ex resume? <laughs> Correct. I mean, maybe for a season, but like not for an extended period of time, no. right? And Stained. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think like you kind of you kind of mentioned that when you when it comes to you know you call it a program, but it's a program is built around consistency. Right. And so you're going to have years where you're, you know, you're just not that very you know, good, but you know, here's where you're very good. Right. And you know, you know, the, the, <laughs> the year you guys won the provincials, uh, that was a, an interesting year because I remember like, again, you know, my perspective being like, I just finished playing, I guess it would have been the year of two years or a year after. Yeah. We won and in March of 02. It was 02. Yeah. And I was a graduate in 01. And this is, I'll tell you what my uh, memory of it was. And I'm going to ask what sure. yours is. Irfan is going to destroy these guys. They, their guards cannot play with them. It does not matter. Irfan's just awesome. D D Daniel's going to kill Dakota. That's what I remember. Now, 
You tell me before you fast forward to that moment, what do you remember about that entire season? Like, or, or maybe let, let me ask, what's the first thing that came to mind when I started talking about that? Uh, I am right now in, at school in, in the math office at my mm -hmm. desk here. And as you say, it, uh, and on my bulletin board straight ahead of me, I have a, uh, the, that team championship picture and, and, uh, it's, it's uh, for sure. I Like, I've been coaching a long time and I've won mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And I've had some people, I mean, only won one. So winning's hard. It is. I, yes. Like, uh, the other teams are trying to win too. <laughs> right? So I, I'm fortunate. I think I've been closer at winning and have had other teams that I thought had a better chance of winning Correct. it all than that year. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. Of the, of the teams I've gone to, let's say, let's say the final four with, uh, that was the team that was probably least likely to win. Not mm -hmm. so much based on them, but just based on uh, on the other teams that were in the final four that year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But who else? Like, so who else was in the final? Who did you guys beat? Then the, the we game played. Before? We played Oak, yeah. and Daniel Daniel played uh, uh, Sturgeon. Uh, okay, so, was it Sturgeon or Silver Heights at the time? It's probably Silver have, Heights still. Silver. Yeah. So, but like we pick our team and we go to the West. We were in the Daniel Mack tournament, which is in mid December. Mm -hmm. So it's one of our first real tests. And I remember if we would, I don't know if which game in the tournament was, we played Daniel Mack in their own tournament. And I think it was 18 to zero for them before we scored. <laughs> so, oh, hey, this isn't, this didn't go very well. So we lose by 25 or 30. And then we play them again a week later in the Westman Classic. So now you're, now it's, if Daniel wasn't public, the Westman Classic is public. Like there's a yeah. lot of people there watching and, I'm thinking to myself, well, this can't go any worse. <laughs> Wrong. And it was 24 to 0 for Daniel before we scored. This is the varsity boys basketball game yeah. at the West Bank Classic, and we're yeah. down 24 to 0 off the hop. <laughs> so we kind of lick our wounds and carry on. And early January, we're in the Piper Classic. And this is our first look at Oak Park. And we score first, which is comforting and we we go up five zero and i think we're down 43 to 15 at half <laughs> like oh just pounded us in the first and we shake hands at the end of the game we lose by a bundle and in the handshake line darren klopik again friend of mine shakes his, shakes my hand and holds me in the in the handshake line and says well that, that'll teach you for going up five zero <laughs> like oh well, so we play out January and uh, we have a couple of kids who at the end of January decide that it's not for them and they, they decide to leave. And uh, I remember we had a team meeting in my classroom about what, what are we doing? Like, what's, what's the goal? What's the big vision here? Mm -hmm. And once we laid that out, we started asking questions about how are we going to do it? What does this look like? What does practice have to look like? Who are the key players here? How are we going to get this done? And that meeting kind of really redirected us and set the tone. And we started putting together a real run of games where we're winning a whole bunch. And we got to, we lost to River East. We lost to River East who had Chris Dick because mm -hmm. they ended up, he was in grade 11 and they yeah. ended up winning provincials the next year. Um, but we, after that meeting, that was our only loss. We didn't lose again. Really? So we were, we finished the year, I'll say, I think we were 23 and eight, but we didn't lose again after January. Oh, sorry. The one game to River East. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, but it all year, all year, there were two teams. It was Oak Park and Daniel Mack, and they yeah. were beating everybody. And the only losses they had were to each other. But mm -hmm. Daniel had, had Irfan who is arguably the best player we've seen in Manitoba in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And he was terrific. So we go into the final four and we actually heading into provincial scrimmaged with, I think it was Silver Heights at the time and Kirby. Um, we scrimmaged with them and we go into, into our final four game and we're playing Oak. And I just remember being, I thought we were really prepared to play that game. Like, we knew what they wanted to do. We knew who did what, new sub rotations, new tendencies. I thought we were really well prepared and we won the game by six or seven in a really low scoring 
mm-hmm. kind of grinding game. I think it was like we were both in the 60s or high 50s. Like it was low scoring, a grinding game. We had that and we're playing Daniel. And in those days, the final was the next night. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Like it's not like now where you play your final four game on a Saturday and you go or a Friday and you go Monday or Saturday, Monday. It's no Friday, Friday, Monday now. Mm-hmm. But for us, it was it was Friday, Saturday. So we win. We got into the uh, into the booth there. And we're watching Daniel play Silver, and like I can't tell you how many times the crowd was going crazy for something Irvin did. Of course, I, of course. Turned, I turned to our assistants and said, "Like our job tomorrow night is to limit the number of times the crowd reacts that way. Mm. Like we just can't let him go off and just start doing all these things that Irvin does." Um, so we had a practice Saturday morning and just kind of a walkthrough. But the main message was if Irfan is around you, just try not to be involved in the game. Yeah. Just go, go away. Like, don't, if you have the ball and he's guarding, you try to get rid of it. Like if he's around the ball, it's bad for us. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure, I'm sure that people came assuming they were going to pound us. Like they had beaten us soundly twice. And not only that, we couldn't score. Yeah. Like it was 18 0, 24 0, and we can't even, we can't score. So we're at U of W. And I remember being at the top of the railing, looking on at the girls' game, waiting for our game to start. And I was standing with Greg Bouchard, who mm-hmm. was one of the coach for Daniel at the time. And Bill Wedlake mm-hmm. uh, came up to us and he put his arm around us and he says, This is going to be great, guys. He said, Two U of W guys playing in my gym. And he was so, so happy that we were both there and yeah but like um i'm sure again people thought we were going to be pounded yeah and uh we won the tip and we went down and we got the ball i think we got it into one of our two bigs it was uh alexi finley we called q q yeah who was, he was he was so big and so strong yeah. and the other one's aj gervais who was borderline yeah. 611 mm-hmm. and i forget which of the first who got the first bucket? One of the two of them got it. We scored, and we're two. We're up two zero, and I can't tell you the relief for going up two zero after the <laughs> previous two games against them. Um, and yeah, we uh, we managed to keep it close the whole way, and we were up two at half, and and one by three. And yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's one of the bigger upsets in recent memory here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like again, is 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 like the way I remember it. And oh, tell me this, Dean, like I know in my last years, there was no shot clock. Were we still rocking with no shot clock that year? Uh, sure. That year, that year was no shot clock. Yeah. Yeah. So now because the way would assume, sorry, people would assume that maybe we held the ball against them and, mm-hmm. and we like the score was in the eighties. It was mm-hmm. 86, 83. Like that's not even by shot clock standards. That's a, that's a highish scoring game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Like, sure. so we didn't, we didn't hold the ball. No, we, we certainly weren't, engaging in a in a track meet and didn't want to go up and down we took our time in the half court uh mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. we could but uh we tried to be as patient as we couldn't get the ball into uh into aj and q yeah yeah and that's possible. what i remember and then correct me if I'm wrong q was the the did he not get mvp was it q he was mvp and he yeah. was somewhat motivated by the fact that he was left off the left off the uh high school top 10 list mm. and uh he wasn't too impressed but, uh, <laughs> There's well, lots what, of good players that year. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what I remember from that game is just your guards, just like just not really dribbling because our fans around. It's like, hey, just right pass it up, to. pass it up. Like, you know, he'd get because again, Irfan did this his whole career. He just picked people's pockets, and so mm-hmm. he was playing at another yep. level in high school. So I just remember you guys just being very cautious. Like it was a very cautiously played game. Like I said, it wasn't necessarily a stalled game. No, no, no. Yep. It was you guys were just like, look, we're going to make these like very, very cautious decisions, and we're going to get it to our bigs, and we're just going to play out of that. And that was kind of like yep. it was very. You could see it, and and as a yep. result of that, like you you like you said, you get the players out of there. You took our fan kind of out of the game to a certain extent. Well, I don't know if we take him out of the game, but we certainly tried to limit how much he was doing. Correct. And, like he wasn't causing as much of the, the defensive chaos. Like if you just said, Hey, like can you dribble the ball up and do this. And yeah. like, I think in about a month earlier in Luther, he had a quadruple, quadruple double in three <laughs> yeah. quarters. Yeah. So like yeah. he did, he did, he had a good game against the big not that. And he yeah. got hurt late in, or midway through the fourth quarter in that championship game. And he sat out for a bit, got taped and came back mm-hmm. and, couldn't go yes i remember that i remember that 
Yeah. And you know, I just, I <laughs> actually, I just remember because I've interviewed a friend for the podcast and he actually brought that up. He's like, you know, I was injured. I got, I rolled my ankle. Remember that. So, but yeah, that's all he, part, part of the game. Our, right? our point guard, our point guard got hurt in the semifinal, didn't play at all. Hmm. Right. David Harvey White got hurt and yeah, didn't, yeah. didn't go. Yeah. But leading up to that, I had a kid on the team come to me and said he had a, uh, he had something he wanted the team to listen to for motivation as we we're heading into playoff okay. potentials. Like, okay, I need to, I need to vet this. Like, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. Playing this for everybody, <laughs> and, and so it was a clip from the movie Any Given Sunday with Al Pacino. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I listened to it, and he brought it to me on a. Again, this is 2002. He brought it to me on a cassette. Of course, yeah. So, and then we carried around a cassette player, and we listened to this thing. No way. Before every game of playoffs and provincials. And for playoffs, this is the old Cloverleaf days, or it was mm -hmm. Dakota, Glenlon, CJS, mm -hmm. Richmond, Massey. So we ended up winning provincials this year. We're third in our zone. Wow. Like we were behind Glenlon and we were behind, and I think Richmond was in first after regular season. So we listened to it. And the first time we listened to it, there's a couple of snickers and chuckles, and the yeah. guys are kind of smirking a little bit. Um, but now we're listening to it for the sixth, seventh time mm. in the change room at UW. There's no laughing. There's no snickering. The guys are dialed in. and um, But I'm listening to it with this player. I think it, I think it was Igor Juric that gave it to me. And we were in my car listening before we go in. And the, it got stuck in my car. <laughs> and so now we're finicking with this cassette player and the like don't break the tape and yeah. but you get it out and it and it's 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 all good so that that team actually that was 2002 and 2000 so the 20 year anniversary we gathered uh we gathered for a reunion nice and, uh, yeah aj flew in from uh from calgary and trevor shaw nice. flew in from ottawa and we had a we had a great time together we had a tour of the school we played a little bit of basketball we had dinner nice. together and yeah it was that's awesome, awesome. So yeah. who um, who were some of the coaches uh, that were with you uh, on that squad? On that team were former players mostly. It was uh, Dean oh. Sacco, Corey Rothenberger, uh, Brian Kidd. Okay. I think I'm looking at the picture now. Yes, that was them. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's uh, all former players. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So when you or have you, I'm sure you have heard that speech since winning, and did it bring back like a feeling of like, did you get that? that buzz yeah a, a, not really a, i've heard no. it again a little bit but it it's didn't bring uh, back it brought, brought back memories it, it sure but there's other things that bring back memories of that day more so than uh more so than the than the audio recording okay yeah yeah but just being oh. with those guys again was was special yeah yeah for sure for sure i mean like you said winning is hard winning is, winning is, is hard. very hard yeah and i i remember you know you've had teams before like Oh man, the Dakotas, they're loaded. They got a great team. And, you know, you didn't win with those teams. And it's such an interesting, you know, when though like there's the there's the times when the team that's supposed to win wins, you know? And that happens that happens often, right? And so like you said, your story was a very much an underdog story. Like it truly was. Like again, I remember yeah, I was like, I these guys say, are gonna get smoked. <laughs> for sure. The, and you weren't alone. <laughs> yeah, everyone alone thought that. that. We were shocked. And 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 you're right, you know, you're um we got to limit our fans like, you know, uh, uh, plays where he gets the crowd involved because, you know, everybody, m myself included, who just played against him was like when he did stuff, you were just blown away. Like, and you would be, but he did oh, wow. He That's did what I mean. Right? He'd, yeah. he'd hit a three. He'd hit deep threes. Yeah. He'd take you off the dribble. He'd pull up. He'd get yeah. a layup. Yep. He'd pass to anybody. Like, you'd find anybody yep. that's open. Yeah. He'd steal. He yeah. could, he'd come from the weak side on rebounds, poke the ball out of your hand, and now he's got like, yeah. Like I said, he, he's as good as anybody we've seen in 30 years. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I just remember he would win the crowd, you know? That's something that he did. And people are just like, this guy's amazing, right? And and so yeah. you, just that, the fact that you noted that, you're like, hey, we got we to gotta just limit him as much as possible from, like, wowing the crowd. And that's going to give us an advantage because no but one I wanted you guys to win. Sorry? Like, I mean, outside, I said no one wanted oh, you guys to win. Sure. Outside, outside yeah. of the Dakota people, yes. but, like, everyone else sure. is like, ah, oh, we don't want that. And I remember being, like, disappointed. I'm like, oh, man, like, our fans, and he still did stuff. Like, it wasn't like he didn't, but, you know, like. And they won the year before. They did. They, they won the year before. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So. And they won with, uh, they had a, they had a big Dwight. Uh, was, yeah, Dwight Brissett. Yes. So yeah. he was, you know, big and thinking like, oh, well, when we won, we had, we had two bigs. 
Yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. we had guys coming off the bench that were also big. Yeah, uh, but um, it it helps. Oh, yeah, it's basketball. It right? <laughs> and they did they did not have they didn't have a matchup for anybody no. AJ size. No, like like to defend and play against somebody who's borderline six eleven. Yeah, you, you need someone who's about six six. Yes, and even that, like five inches, is still that's a lot. Like, but that's I think lot, the yeah. biggest guy was six two, six three, and yeah, they had a, they had a super you're small up team. A lot of, you're giving up a lot of size there. Yeah. yeah, they had a small team, and like you said, Q was Q was not Q was not a small man. He was uh, he was no. very big, so and, and great hands. But no, that's um, so great I mean, hands. Yeah, great hands. Yeah, that great was his hands. thing, right? Just keep the ball high. <laughs> like he just like I remember playing with him like later on after, and he kept playing for a while. And um, yeah, it was tough. He was he would come into the gym out of shape. It didn't matter. It's, it's men's, and he would just like be physical inside, get offensive rebounds, miss his own shot, get his own rebound, put it back in. Yep. You know, That's good it. passer um, out of the post. He, he started to develop a little bit of that. I'm not sure he had it in high school, but uh, I've often yeah. said about him: if you line our guys up at one end line and said race to the other end, he's last. <laughs> but if but if you but if you lined them up and said you had to move. You, the race was only going to be two feet long. His yes. first step yeah. for a big guy yeah. Yeah. was very quick. Yeah. And so when he caught it and he could he could catch and he could finish and he's so big, his he would bump and displace you. Yep. But he would do it so fast. And his his first step to covering two feet was very quick for a big yeah. guy. Yep. And you you couple that with taking a bump from a guy who's well over two hundred pounds. And he dis- displaces you, dislodges you. He's going to finish. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So sp- I want to speak about some of those other teams that you had that you didn't sure. win at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you guys had success, right? And maybe maybe some of those teams are teams that you actually are memorable to you. But it wasn't because you guys were great. There's other reasons. So you know, when I start, you know, you can kind of go sense where I'm going with this question. But who are some of the most memorable? Uh, teams that you that you've had throughout the years, um, and then what do you remember about them? Oh, the fi- the teams that went to the final four are so they memorable. But like, I have fun coaching. Like, yes, the goal is to win, but mm-hmm. it it only happens to one team every year. That doesn't mean everything along the way is a, is a loss. And mm-hmm. I try to keep in touch with lots of kids that I've coached, or they try to keep in touch with me. Uh, so I have lots of good memories along mm-hmm. the way with with all the teams mm-hmm. um for sure like i but the one kid that sticks out to me and, and i hate the question who's the best kid you've ever coached mm-hmm. and i don't think that's fair to for me to uh, fair to answer and to kind of disparage some of the hard work that lots of kids have done to try to be to improve their own game so mm-hmm. i don't like the question who's the best kid i've coached but um, I will tell you the hardest working kid I've ever coached is Phil Labongo. Mm. And it's, it's, I don't think it was close. Like his, his drive to be better at this um, is something the kids today who think they work hard, uh, they have no idea until they would watch this guy do a workout and not just a basketball workout, a weightlifting workout, a shooting mm-hmm. workout, a running workout. Um, it's, it's, he was as, um, into basketball as any kid I've ever, ever been a part of. And um, my personal time with him is something I'm going to remember forever. Like, and he was close mm-hmm. with me. He was close with my family. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, he, he's a kid I will, I will uh, never forget. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Lots, lo- we could make the podcast about him. Lots of so many good stories. We're playing in the, I don't know if it was a final or a semifinal in the St. Mattel tournament at Glenlawn. Mm-hmm. And we're playing against Garden City and my friend Phil Penner. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the score at the end was 63-58. That was for two players. <laughs> Phil had 63, <laughs> and Marco Milosevic had 58. <laughs> Marco, and we, I think Marco. we won. Yes. And I think we won... 103 to 99 something it was something stupid <laughs> right but the two of them put on a display yeah and philip ended up with i think he had 63 and the game ended and we're at glenlon and my buddy john wolf looks over and he says dean i don't think anybody filmed it 
and this oh, was in wow. 20, 2010 and there was no recording of it there was no live stream so the game yeah. is lost i have the score i had the score sheet yeah but there was no uh yeah there's no digital record of it which is a shame and mm -hmm. um but i also remember driving my family and i were driving to a friend's house for a swim he philip was in grade 11 maybe and our car broke down coincidence right at the entrance to the school so i would manage to get the car into the parking lot and i think i called their the family we were going to go visit and they were going to come pick up my wife and the kids and uh i was going to wait there for caa and car drives up and it's philip he gets out of the car i said oh, what are you what are you doing here so oh, i saw you so you standing here and thought you might need help. I said, explain what was going on. I'm like, well, I don't think you can fix my car. And he says, well, I'll wait for you. I'll wait with you till CA comes. I said, okay, yeah. great. And what are you doing today? I said, why are you driving by? And he points across the street at the apartment block. And he says, well, there, he says, I know two things. Their front door is unlocked and there's 13 flights of stairs. So I'm doing stairs today. Wow. So he, was, he was there. He was going to run stairs. And not just stairs like up your bleachers and back. Yeah, yeah. Or like from one. Floors. No, th there's thirteen. So there's there's flights there. So I'm just just going to work on work on that today. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. And I I could tell you so many more things like that about him. His his work ethic, uh, and just the kind of person he was. Is stuff I'll remember. Yeah, yeah. I and again, I don't. I um, oddly enough, I know his his sister, but I don't. I just remember him from playing. Like I didn't really know him. I just remember how mm -hmm. how talented he was. Like he's super talented. Um, like you said, like you could tell, like he was a hard worker, right? Like there was no yeah. question about that. What yeah. what year was that? Um, that he was his eleven and twelve. He like, what graduated and he graduated twenty ten. Okay, yeah. So that was. So we yeah, lost okay. in the final four that year to St. Paul's. They had Joey Nitichork. Ah, uh, yeah, it was Joey. Okay. Uh, Tanner Droward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of two also again, good. two two bigs. <laughs> Amir Ali, yeah, good point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but uh, I, yeah. I miss him. To, I, I miss Philip to uh, to this day. Yeah, yeah, and I, and again, those for who don't know, like Philip's past, right? So this is um, yes. Yeah, um, yeah it's uh, it um, it's always tough. I mean, like I remember when I asked Ross Wed like a, a similar question, and he and oddly enough, um, he didn't say I hated it, but he said I'm not going to answer that. And he, and he gave me an answer like you. And he talked about a player who was just super hardworking and, and he remembers yep. to this day and he has a connection with him. Yep. I think that's, um, I think there's always, I always get this from, I always go back to Kirby, but I know many of people, I think Colleen said it too, but the, like the, you know, and the journey with basketball is like you, first you think it's about basketball. And, and again, some people have the insight way beyond this, but you know, as a kid, this is definitely what you think. And, I remember going through this myself and having other people experiences, but then later on, you're like, this is nothing to do with basketball, right? Like this is like all things in life. This is just about people and your connection to them and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, going through things with them. Um, and uh, that's why this podcast is, is, you know, I've, I've appreciated this podcast so much because I get to hear, you know, personal stories and, and people opening up about the experiences that they've had uh, through yeah. basketball. It's, you know? it's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. And if you can create good relationships, you can help kids attain the next level. But like, like I said at the beginning about me, you, you said about me being a nice guy. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm not interested in doing this at the expense of mm -hmm. relationships. Yep. Like I yep. want kids to have a good experience. I want when they're done for them to want to have a conversation with me about anything five, 10, 20 years after they've played. Mm -hmm. That would be important to me. And I'm lucky. I've got some former players that have, have kind of stuck around as assistant coaches or come and gone as assistant coaches or mm -hmm. just come to the odd game. And some have, have become people I would consider to be good good friends of mine to this day. Mm -hmm. So it's a mm -hmm. bit of an age gap. But like I, I appreciate those, those relationships uh, very much. Yeah. Yeah. And especially when you've been at one place for so long, right? Like you, you, mm -hmm. you know, when you start talking about legacy – um, community, uh, you talk about program and the values and, sure. and making those connections. That's how that stuff gets formed, right? Is the fact that you can still be there and, and someone um, who was a, a high school kid could go, drive by and be like, you know what? I have, I feel comfortable going in the gym. I know Coach Favoni's probably in there practicing. Okay. Like, I'm going to go take a look. And you would be yeah. like, hey, how's it going? Like, how have you been? Right. Or actually, well, this is just a question I'll ask you. Have you ever coached? Uh, like, I guess you're getting close to that age. Has anyone come by? I mean, you've had kids where some people that you've coached, your their kids have 
I don't, I don't know if you're that old yet, but uh, you're close. I'm not close. close? I, I'm not close to that age. I'm I'm there. Um, I was gonna say, yeah. So I haven't I haven't coached a father and a son yet, okay. but I've I've taught people and then coached their sons. Okay. Okay. So that's happened, and it's been the, <laughs> been the uh, yeah. So <laughs> for sure. That, that must yeah. be a little bit wild. Like, hey, like, yeah. Yep. So, so I have this thing. <laughs> no, absolutely. So I have this, this thing whenever people say, man, time flies. And I say, yeah, I mean, it does. But like, realistically, if you think back of all your life, like so much stuff has happened, like, so, you know, it flies, but it doesn't really. But when you have those moments, you must be like, oh, wow. Like, yeah, it's like a moment, like it's like a slap in the face, like, okay, like, yeah. I'm well, here now, this person is an adult, or I'm teaching them, or, you know, yep. Or, or for, for those, I'll tell a story to my team now about a kid that or from a player that reached out and wished us good luck or congratulated us on something and I'll mm. say, Oh, I coached him in and if I say like twenty ten, they'll go, Oh yeah. my god, that's all yeah, yeah. twenty ten. I said I was talking to a guy that graduated in ninety seven the other day and, and he was yeah. he wanted our schedule because he wants to come watch a game and mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. like Yeah. I mean, yeah. I tell them that like ninety seven, like Yeah, they're blown away. But that was forever ago. <laughs> but that's what that's what I said when I when I opened the podcast. When I was I was I had graduated and played college, and I was coaching in high school. And I saw and I still was like, I don't know who's this old timer. Seems like it's like you know your perspective as a child or a teenager is or a young adult is is way different as when you've you know you've grown a bit. But just speaking about the community and legacy, I mean, we in the bio there, I, I mentioned. Um, you know, the big fundraising initiative that you were a part of there at Dakota um, in building, you know, there's a beautiful field there now. And then there's that outdoor court that's, um, yep. you know, named after Dale Bradshaw. So, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about just how that even happened and how it came to be. I think like lots of good ideas and good things was kind of, I wouldn't say an accident, but it was certainly nothing that on the outset we planned to do here. And um, I have a lot of involvement with the Manitoba Marathon. I've been on the, I was on their board for six years and I'm part of the committee that puts on the race every year. I've done that every year since I started teaching and Jerry Elchina, Mr. Jerry Elchina got me involved in that. And I came out of a meeting. I think I was at Sorrento's okay. on Grant <laughs> and uh, we had a wrap year end marathon wrap up meeting and I was going to my car and it was pouring rain, not just like, you know, I'm going to get a little, like, it was enough that I was like pausing at the door. Like, okay, when am I timing my run to the car? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and uh, there was a guy came up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder, guy I knew from the meeting. And he said, oh, Dean, look at it outside. He said, this looks like a great excuse for you to buy me a beer. Mm. I said, oh, okay. So he sat down. His name is Les Weens. He's a Dakota grad from, I think, in the mid-70s. And he said, do you ever get guest speakers at school? And I said, yeah, from time to time. And he said, what would, what would I, what would you do if I told you I could get Coach Carter from the movie Coach Carter? And I said, oh, that'd be great. And he had <laughs> heard Coach hold on, Carter. Hold on. Speak. hold on, sorry, sorry, I got to interrupt you. Yeah. Did you believe him at the time? Like, oh, that'd be great. Were you like this guy's? Come on. No, I would listen some more. <laughs> okay, okay. And yeah, he had been at an event, and Coach Carter spoke, and he says he's pretty, pretty dynamic. Like, yeah. I think this would be good for high school, and so. Les and I talked for a bit and said, okay, well, let's get him to come to the school. And I thought he'd come to the school. We'd have the local community, the Lance or the Metro, whatever you yeah, call it yeah. now, would cover it. We'd get his picture in the in the paper and yeah. that'd be that. And he said, well, why don't we use him to raise some money? So then we started talking about what we want to raise money for. And then it kind of snowballed into like, our field sucks. Like mm -hmm. we have a field outside. We have a massive grassed area in a big L-shaped and it's, there's nothing there. Like there's two soccer goalposts at the time that aren't the right distance apart. And the field is terrible. Like <laughs> you don't play anything there. Like it used to be, they tell me from predates my time at Dakota, that it used to be the dumping ground for construction of new homes. No way. So it was like stuff was leaching to the top of concrete. Like it's bad. So he said, why don't we try to do, and then we just started brainstorming and then, we sat down, we ended up hiring an architect. One thing leads to another. And now the school division gives me and at the time, the vice principal here, Robbie Major, gives us the go-ahead. I think they gave us the go-ahead because they didn't think they, anything was going to happen. Yeah. But they gave us the go-ahead to start fundraising for this. And it was like, oh, okay, we're going to put in an artificial turf field. 
And again, one thing leads to another. And now we have an artificial turf, full size CFL field with lights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have an outdoor basketball court named after Dale Bradshaw with lights. Mm -hmm. We have a cricket batting cage, which was the first thing to go in. We have a, a tennis court, pickleball courts. We have an out, we have a community garden. We have an indigenous learning circle. We have, um, stands we have a, a video tower like mm -hmm, and some mm -hmm. of this is once you get going with the fundraising and people realize this is actually going to happen other people are willing to yes, contribute of course um, but we ran these gala dinners we ran five gala dinners to raise community awareness and money and the first gala dinner was coach carter um who was as dynamic as les had promised he was mm. terrific he was he was good at the gala dinner he was great when he spoke in the afternoon to the kids mm. like terrific and he told me a story before he went on that when he was coaching he had a rule that nobody dunked against us mm. so nobody dunks against us like i don't know how you control that but nobody dunks and he and he says he told this team if you dunk on me he says you guys are running home like you're not getting on the bus i don't know how far their school was but he's not getting on the bus you're gonna you're gonna have to run home behind the bus so middle of the game, some kid on the other team has a breakaway and he's going to dunk the ball. And Coach Carter tells me the story that a kid from his team left the bench and tackled the guy to prevent the dunk. To wow. save them from running to save them from running home. Come on. So he tells me before he goes on to you know entertain <laughs> our, our school body. But we had Coach Carter was great. We had John uh, Montgomery from Amazing Race Canada, the gold mm -hmm. medalist in Skeleton, and, and Jay Onright mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. TSN. We had um, a Jets with Dale Howarchuk and Mark Scheifele. We had a few Bombers. And then the last one we did in 2018 was uh, Donovan Bailey, mm -hmm. Olymp Olympic and world champion. Yeah. And uh, yeah. got to reconnect with him the other day at uh, his book signing at McNally. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, it was great. So that the field now has transformed our school and the the culture here, and it's it's we've gone from nothing to an amazing facility. And and at the end, when we were really searching for the last bit of money to put us over the top, Dan Murray uh, from Murray Chevaux came through, and uh, that's why the field is called Murray Field at Dakota Collegiate. Got it. Got it. Got it. Well, I'll tell you this right now. So, I mean, it's transformed the school, but I would go so far as to say it's it's helped transform the community, like outside of the school, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I know for a fact that um, I well, I don't know this for a fact, but um, did the football program not even start there until the field was there, or was it there before? No, we had it. We had a team before we had a field, and they played all away games. Got it. Got it. Um, but I think the team has had some decent success uh, in, in uh, the last, this past. Uh, uh, yeah, the past season was our first four A. Yeah. They call it 4A or the top division. Yeah, champion. yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. kind of been like moving up kind of over the years type Correct. thing, right? Yeah. Yes, they started in the third tier. I think they yeah. won that, moved up and won the second tier. I yeah. may have stayed there again, and then they've been gradually getting a little bit more, yeah. a little better every year. Yeah, yeah. And then I know for uh, um, soccer, uh, the the whole school division um, plays like their whole the season there, like all the games yeah, will be the, the urban, there. Urban soccer is in the spring. Mm -hmm. And the weather is a crapshoot in the spring. Mm -hmm. So if you go in and play on a grass field yeah. on a nice day, fine. But then it rains or you go down there too quickly after the thaw, you mm -hmm. chew it up. And mm -hmm. now you're now you if it's you could be off it to let yeah. it yeah. kind of nurture itself back to good good standing again. You could be off for a week or two weeks and the and the soccer season isn't long enough to allow yeah. that. So they Absolutely. just put every game here. It's yeah, great. yeah, and that's what I mean. Like again, it's 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 absolutely absolutely changed. And again, you mentioned the pickleball. You mentioned, you know, the the basketball court obviously is there. Like it's um, anytime you can, you know, you have a presence like that uh, in in the area, it's going to affect change. Like I brought I brought up the football team just because it's an easy example of like, sure. okay, this led to this, but there's all sorts of stories because you know I know for a fact that um, you know when you talk to people, they'll say, oh, like I I got my start playing here, for example, or mm -hmm. I, you know I went maybe someone's conversation is now going to be like hey when i started playing basketball my brother took me to you know the, the dakota the dale bradshaw court and they you know yeah. just shot around like that okay. would be like their first kind of or one of their one of their memories you know i love driving through and seeing people playing cricket people watching cricket um mm -hmm. a game on the basketball court's full um i, I love just watching kids play 
Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and we've had Valor FC has come and used it as practice. Uh, mm. the, some of the bombers come individually and do some do some yes. workouts there and yeah, yeah it's 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 well used it's it's great yeah yeah no absolutely and it's and it's a it's a it's a legacy i mean that kind of stuff is uh like you said there's a you know, driving by it must give you just like a nice uh, you're like man this yeah. is this is special this is cool like you know because yeah. uh had it not been for that uh rainy day or the the meeting you're Correct. at or yeah. whatever, and, and many the, many of things somebody like having somebody like robbie major at the time the two of us devoting that kind of time to getting it done and and the yeah. ups and downs along the way uh, it wasn't a straight line to raising that kind of money. I'll tell you that there was mm -hmm. money given, money taken back, money given, um, sure. money raised, private, public, um, and there's support of people at the school, their principal, Jill Mathe as well. Like, it's uh, yeah, something we're really yeah. proud of. Here. Yeah, it's a com it's a community effort in that case, right? Yeah. Um. Okay, so I have a few questions. We're coming close to an end here. Sure. Um, sure. So I'll ask you this straight off the top. Tell me your funniest basketball story, <laughs> or whatever comes to mind when I ask you that. It can be, funny. it doesn't have to be on the court either, or it doesn't yeah, yeah, yeah. Have to, you know, like it can be anything, just something like, that comes to mind. There's lots of little things. Like I, if I've done this long enough that I'm not doing it, if I don't laugh, so mm. it's nothing outlandish all the time, but I, I, I try to laugh most games and practices, or at least make fun of something going on. Um, I remember at Canada games and again, this Philip Longo story, we were in line during the opening ceremonies and everybody got to meet the prime minister who at the time was Stephen Harper mm. and the governor general. So uh, we're in line and Philip's in line close to me and everyone's just saying, hello, nice to meet you kind of thing. And, and I think Philip says to him, I'm going to have your job one day <laughs> to the prime minister. <laughs> wow. Wow. And Stephen Harper, who I don't think is known for his uh, great, no, he's pretty dry. Comedic wit, <laughs> but uh, he, he comes back at Philip right away with, well, you can have it. <laughs> Very nice. Very yeah. nice. Very nice. Um, That's cool. I remember get, getting ready to go to Luther one year, um, and you had to do a skit, and you prepare some video yeah, for yeah. Luther. And, and we thought we'd take our one of our smaller guys, his name is Dean Sacco. We'd have him. He would go up and dunk. We'd make it look like he's dunking, but he was going to run and jump off somebody's back. Like, you'd get mm -hmm. down on his yeah, on all yeah. fours, and he'd and launch himself up and dunk it. And it was great. So... Uh, Dean went up and did this. Well, Dean jumped a little higher and caught a little more air than he anticipated and collided with the backboard. Come on. And yes, come scrambling <laughs> down. And he was fine. He was fine. Oh, and in preparation for so he's going up to dunk and he like is too high and he kind of bails right. on hits the side of the backboard. Oh yeah. His shoulder is or like flipped. over. No, no, no. I didn't go over. No, oh, okay. No, okay. No, like, no, I mean no, like no, over no, the no, rim, no. sorry, over the rim. Yeah. He's rim height. His, oh, wow. he's, hitting, he's hitting backboard. And oh, okay. He, so he's, he yeah, falls. I get you. I get you. I, but get as you. We're, I was, I knew this question about funniest moment was coming and it's, it's at his expense, but I chatted with him to make sure it was okay to tell the story. And, and he says, yeah, but you make sure you tell them the ball went in. He said, he made, made the bucket. So <laughs> nice, nice, nice. But like, yeah. I, I don't know about funny. Like I try to have fun all the time. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I don't even know when I started a tradition of having the guys get together for a team meal over the winter break. And mm -hmm. so I make a big thing at Chile and we get together at somebody's house and yeah. uh, just to do something away from basketball. I, like, I think that's something that guys look back and, and remember and appreciate. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just try absolutely. to make the experience memorable. Absolutely. And I think, I think, you know, when I, when I say, you know, Dean's a nice guy, Dean's a nice guy. I think all the things you've said are, are the things that I'm talking about, right? It's like, you're, you're doing things for the community. You're making sure people feel comfortable. Um, you know, you're checking in with your team. Like these types of things obviously extend outside of just basketball, right? It's, it's who you are, who you've become uh, over, over these years. Right. And so I know some referees may not think during the game, you know, Dean's nice, but they probably say, hey, you know, what? you know, I run into Dean after he's, he's fine. It's just, everyone gets competitive. Right. And so, Correct. you know, you, the, you know, I judge people off of their actions and I can tell someone that say that they're nice, even if they're not like kind, you know, you are all both kind and nice. Thank you. Um, Thank and, you. Uh, you know, I really, I really uh, have always appreciated uh, just being around you, man, and just talking with you. It's always like, you know, you're one of the few people. And uh, yes, I'm throwing shots at the people who aren't like this. But like you see Dean and you're like, hey, hey, how's it going? Like, it's, it's you know, you're not like, oh, man, there's Dean. <laughs> oh, you're shopping and you're like, I'm just going to go over here, you know. And let's be honest, like we all have some people like that that are in our lives. Right. And so you're not one of those people. Um, but yeah, so I anyways, think that I, was I, one of the stories. It was one of the lessons. I think it was Phil Hudson 
who had taught me that said, do you want to conduct yourself as a teacher and a coach so that 10 years from now, when a former player or a student sees you across the street and they mm. don't, and you don't see them, you don't see them, but they see you. Will yep. they cross the street to say hi to you? Wow. Yeah. That's it right there. That's exactly what I was talking so about. I, yeah. 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 That's uh that's a good, well, you succeeded. <laughs> we'll say that much. You've succeeded. So um, on that note, I mean, that's kind of leads us into the last question here. And so sure. I like to end the podcast with advice. And I mean, you've given a ton just through your stories. That last one right there was, uh, was a piece of advice that a, a coach or even just a person, a teammate, uh, you know, um, a, a boss, anyone can take um, and apply. So pretty much, I really like to end the podcast with some advice. Um, and so let's just imagine that you're in a room and you're in front of coaches uh, and they're hungry for your knowledge. You've been in the game for over 30 years. I want What I would like you to do is think about three things that you'd like to leave them with, right? So three ideas, concepts, principles of things that are gonna help them in their coaching journey um, and lessons that you've learned uh, along the way. Now, it can be something that you've already talked about in this and you wanna elaborate or it can be something sure. brand new. So what would you say to them? Yeah. I would say one of the biggest pieces of advice and. I think this is relevant today because the, the game has changed in, in terms of when I started, the only place that kids could play was school. So the mm -hmm. only places that basketball coaches existed were school and they were predominantly school teachers. So now mm -hmm. there's coaches needed at school. There's coaches needed at community centers, community clubs. There's coaches needed on club teams. Mm -hmm. It's, it's exploded. So, so many more opportunities for kids to play so many more, coaches needed like i'm sure every basketball convener at a club has heard has has had to utter the line hey we need a coach or a yeah. parent to step up here <laughs> yeah or the, or this team isn't going to run and so somebody says yes and they don't know what they're doing but they're willing to to learn and, and to give it a go which is which is fantastic but my i even at this point in my career i still read i still click on youtube videos and and try to get information that way but and i still go to clinics but i think the best way to learn is by talking directly with somebody book an appointment to talk to somebody um who's at your level above your level whatever that means ask if you can attend somebody else's practice mm. go, like and i do this often like i kirby shep and i are good friends and he's he's willing to let me come in and, and i go to a bunch of practices before my season starts and I just, I kind of watch and listen and I go, why do you do that? How do you, I've, I've talked to Mike Rainbow before and gotten some information. But when I was coaching provincial team with Kirby Shep and Jeff LePayne, well, there's no better coaching education program than working with two guys like that for a summer. And mm -hmm. they, they probably don't know this, but when I was coaching with them, they'd say something, I'd have a notebook off to the side. Well, I really mm -hmm. liked what they did and I would write it down <laughs> and I would do that over and over for the two summers we spent together and like mm -hmm. it's valuable information like there's lots of coaches who would be willing to have other people come in and watch or willing to kind of talk to them about stuff like i've benefited so much from people like darren clappick and martin riley like i said mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. um nick lowler i coached with mm -hmm. him provincial team i was his assistant and i coached against him when he was a player <laughs> i was gonna say I, <laughs> yeah i we're good friends now and mm -hmm. we talk basketball all the time. And when he was coaching the Vincent Massey team, it wasn't routine, but like more than once or twice a week, we'd get home from practice in the evening, call each other and just compare notes. Like, how was it today? What, what did you work on today? And like, that's, that's, that's really valuable. If you can get in a room with somebody and you can't be shy about asking, ask somebody, you know, ask somebody you don't know mm -hmm. coaches. Have you met a basketball coach that doesn't, doesn't like talking about basketball? No, like most, most love it. Most, yeah, most won't shut up about yeah, it. <laughs> they're they're going to want to talk and they're going to want to share with, with the, yeah. some information with you. And yeah. like I teach in a school with Eric Sung, mm -hmm. whose wife coaches the buys and women's team and mm -hmm. he coaches very successful here. And mm -hmm. he loves basketball almost as much as Graham Bodner does. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> but like I, I'm in the same building with him. We talk yeah. basketball often, mm -hmm. but we also have a standing policy that during the season, we sit with each other during games. Like, hey, my I got so and so can't make it today as an assistant. Do you want to sit with us today? Great. Oh, wow. And so we sit with each other. 
during games. And I'm not sure how useful I am to him when I sit, but like a bit of a sounding board sometimes and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. him the same for me. So that, that would be that I think the biggest thing is call somebody up, book an appointment with somebody, talk to them about what they do, ask the questions of topics and things that you think you are deficient in that you're struggling with mm -hmm. book appointment, go, go watch somebody coach or practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and if you're a club coach, go watch, go watch a high school, go like flip it around. Like do, just go and be immer immerse yourself for a while watching somebody else do something, mm -hmm, invite mm -hmm. somebody in, in, or get an assistant that you know, for sure is more experienced and more knowledgeable than you. And that is a, that takes some courage to have an assistant that, you know, at the outset, is more knowledgeable than you because now mm -hmm. you're thinking you could be thinking back your mind like oh what do they think but mm -hmm. you get someone that you can trust who's got a knowledge base that can help you develop mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i love that man i love that I, and I, I like it because it uh i mean to be able to do that you do have to somewhat remove a bit of that uh pride prideful ego that some people may have especially when you're a young coach so they either have fear or their ego or maybe those are yeah. two of the same things but it requires you to say, look, like the only way I'm going to get better here um, is to to work with people, right? And you've yeah, talked and throughout this whole podcast about that, like building community, connecting with people. That was like the first thing when I asked you how you got into it. You you said, hey, I went and found the volleyball coach. You didn't go find another yeah. basketball coach. You just found another coach and said, hey, like I'm just going to learn as much as I can from you. The, the ego, the ego thing. Like I would say that most coaches have somewhat of an ego. Well, we all like, do. Yes, for sure. Yeah. But like, and that's what I enjoyed about my time as an assistant with the provincial team with Jeff and Kirby and, and, uh, and Nick, and I'm the assistant. Um, like, I don't think my ego's big enough that I'm offended when Kirby doesn't take my advice or he like, yes, yeah. it's, it's yeah. I just want, I just want to be part of it and help out and, and learn what I can learn along the way. But, uh, I, I think that's valuable so latching on for a, uh, a minimum an hour or a few practices or invite somebody in to run your practice. Like mm -hmm. I brought going way back, Greg Bouchard has come in and run a practice. Martin Riley has run one, run a practice for me. Um, like all kinds of people have, mm -hmm. I've invited in as guests to, to help out here and there. It's, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. how you learn and get better. Yeah. Yeah. I love don't, that. Don't, if you try if you try to do it in a silo, I think you're, I think you're not going to learn as much as you, as you should be learning. Yeah, yeah, or or you might learn it and take you twenty years, and you could have learned it in a single season, for example. For sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Point. It definitely speeds up your process. Um, and so on that note, I know uh, obviously we're not going to be giving out your number or anything, but I mean, people are listening, and you've been, you know, you know, you know, Coach Favoni, but you don't know Coach Favoni. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm assuming if people saw you or they found, got your email address somehow, they that you would be open to. For sure. Talking basketball. But like I said, them. I'm I'm one of I'm one of many men. Like I know. There, there's I know. lots of there's lots of I would be willing to, <laughs> to talk or to have someone come watch. Uh, but there, there's lots of people that For are sure. willing to to open yep. up their practices. Yep. yep. Without a doubt. For it's, sure. That, like you said before, the basketball community in Winnipeg is small and fairly tight knit, and there's lots yep. of people willing to share share their yep. knowledge. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Well, um, I think that uh, is going to wrap it up for us. Um, I, I appreciate you taking the time. I know that uh, I joked earlier on that you're one of our few listeners, but we do have we do have quite a few listeners. But I do know that you are someone who listens to the podcast. And so having you on uh, is has been nice. Um, I, like I said, there's been many people who have requested you. You got to get you on. So um, to get you on was great. And uh, and to hear your stories, um, oddly enough, although we probably have more connections than we even started to talk about, I don't or didn't know much about, you know, how you even got into coaching or your origin story or anything like that. I just, uh, um, yeah. So it's, it's, and this is what I appreciate so much about, you know, doing this here is I get to hear people's story and even someone like you knew who I've known for a long time, I don't know, you know? And so right. I appreciate you coming on and sharing and, uh, and, and telling your basketball story. It's been fun. I appreciate the invite. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay. Take care, Dean. Bye, Doris. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Please like, subscribe, follow, and share this series, and reach out to us with your comments on the show. Thanks again for joining us.